Imagine you live in an era of near infinite inventive possibility. And during this time, we have things that are smaller, hardware that's smaller and easier to be able to develop using. New languages have emerged onto the market that get, make it more powerful for us to be able to build devices and start programming them. And yet we're left with web technology in this realm where it's kind of weird. I don't know if you guys remember bulletin boards. It was a lot of fun back then. Well, stuff started exploding in the web market during this time. We sort of felt like we were in the middle of uh, hardware development and web development, but uh, the web started to take off with, uh, uh, the, uh, with AOL. I, don't, I have a billion of these things. You know. And from there, a lot of the effort has been focused mainly on driving that component. People have seen the capability of being able to just make SaaS software available online and build development teams that can, can just very easily spin up these services. And so we started to like, focus less on hardware and focus more on software. And now the new web is really paving a way to be able to do some interesting things thanks to Phoenix. Phoenix has a really interesting component to it that really makes the embedded development uh, uh, ideas come to life again, and that is the idea of channels. Uh, channels we, uh, uh, give us the capability of uh, doing real-time connections with browsers and uh, desktop computers, mobile devices and tablets, but in addition, we can do some interesting things with channels to be able to also bring into the sense of tiny little sensors and devices. This kind of stuff that's starting to like break forward into this new realm. So what does that landscape look like? Well, back in the day, we were talking about we would build hardware products. That's what developers were. When Erlang came out, uh, uh, we were, they were originally built for running telephone uh, switches and running on hardware. And then, like I said, we, we started then becoming application developers. But then the application developers became heavy web developer centric. And we're just kind of finding ourselves back into this realm now where we're like, where'd all the hardware developers go? We've got this great set of languages and features that give us the capability of reaching out and making these, dare I say it, IoT, Internet of Things devices. Uh, but we're at a lack of people. Uh, I mean, everybody that's out in the community, it just seems like uh, they're stuck in a time where it's all the embedded space is, uh, is like C and C++, and it's just difficult to be able to uh, uh, get something up and running there. So that's what we try to do. Uh, we run the NERVS project. Uh, we as in a community of developers and people. Uh, my name's uh, Justin uh, Schneck. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about NERVS. So like, what is NERVS exactly? Some of you may know, some of you may not know. Well, NERVS is a great platform that gives you the ability to package up together embedded firmware using Elixir and any dependencies in the Elixir ecospace that you want to be able to include. You can also include C and other things as well, but we'll get into that a little bit more. Primarily, NERVS helps bring your hardware dreams to life. So you can produce wonderful products like the smart hairbrush. <laughs> but seriously, there's a lot of great development that you can do out there with this. Uh, to boil it down to its basics, NERVS is essentially a marriage uh, of, uh, between the Linux kernel and the Erlang virtual machine. Uh, we believe that Erlang uh, is, uh, the Erlang, the Beam, the VM, is actually a great place to be able to call home if you were to consider it your OS. So with NERVS, we, we build this firmware bundle, and the intention of it is to boot Linux directly to Erlang, cut out all the stuff in between. Now, how do we do that? Well, we give you the, uh, we, we basically take your Elixir project and your dependencies, and we build an OTP release out of it. On a separate track, we also take Linux and C libraries and the Erlang runtime, and we put that into a series of what we call NERVS systems. These are sort of the base OS systems that you would use to be able to deploy to different targets. In this case, this is showing the Raspberry Pi Zero system that we have, and um, that's this tiny little development board here. I think I have some more information on that as well. Uh, so let's look at this in a different perspective. Um, it gives you the capability of flexibly taking any kind of dependencies that you want, uh, all of your packages and Linux, and then putting them into this structure, and then out on the other end comes this firmware uh, that we call it. So let's look at the firmware a little bit and see what that's, that looks like. On a NERVS device, uh, since these are for building embedded, uh, primarily for building embedded devices, 
When something's in the field, the case that you want to be able to prevent the most is uh, getting your device into a brick state, because it's worth nothing then at that point, and it's really difficult to be able to manage. So we have uh, two locations where we'll write what the fir that firmware two that's on that, uh, uh, essentially that's the space. Uh, we have an A slot and a B slot. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to uh, stream an update to the, to the, let's say, the inactive partition. In this case, the B firmware B slot is inactive. And so we're going to say, OK, I'm running. I'm receiving an update. I'm going to stream the update into my firmware B slot. And then you can sort of activate it and reboot and then run some tests. And if the tests fail, you can essentially revert back to a known good working state before the update so that you can prevent those brick locations. The important part about this graphic is also the read-only aspect of it. The RO means read-only. And we make the drive, sort of you consider the, uh, the, the, the OS, the file system that your application in Linux is running under directly, we make that read-only because uh, immutability in this case is uh, really interesting uh, to be able to extend past the language of Elixir and Erlang and into the OS and firmware images that you're, uh, excuse me, that you're delivering. That way you'll know that when you deliver that product, it's always going to come up the same way. We understand that you're going to need to persist some data, and so there's also flexibility in the system that allows you to be able to declare additional uh, partitions that are going to be on there uh, to be able to store things, files, uh, cache, things like that. So right now we have a series of NERV systems that, uh, uh, that we officially support. Um, and the officially supported list of hardware here, we support all the Raspberry Pi uh, computers, including the compute modules, uh, the Zero, the Zero W. Uh, we also support the BeagleBone Black and BeagleBone Green platform. And uh, a really fun one, the LEGO EV3. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, it's pretty cool. There's some videos online, I believe, of some people who uh, built using uh, the LEGO EV3 platform a color sorting robot that uh, runs all on, uh, on NURBS as well. So why Elixir and NURBS for embedded, or why NURBS, uh, uh, why is it great for embedded devices? Well, primarily it's because of Elixir. And when, when uh, in the past I would, I would actually build things using like Arduinos or smaller microcontrollers, the moment that I wanted to be able to do anything more extensive or uh, uh, heavier computing or connectivity wise, it was, uh, uh, would fall short. But first of all, getting access to these higher level languages and dependencies lets us program in a way that it feels more natural to us uh, as uh, um, uh, Elixir, Phoenix web developers. And the first thing that we get out of this is the fault tolerance. Preventing that brick state is very, is very important. And um, doing everything that we can from the outside to prevent it is uh, 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 equally as important as it is to try to do everything on the inside of your application to prevent it as well. So fault tolerance, as you know, gives us the supervision trees where we can reach out and talk to the, the C libraries with ports. We also have our processes. And uh, building on top of that, uh, you can see uh, the fault tolerance and supervision trees gives us a great way to be able to recover internally uh, so that we can keep running as well. Another beautiful thing that Elixir gives us is pattern matching. Uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, binary parsing. Uh, when you're doing embedded devices, you're typically connecting with a lot of sensors or things like that. And it's important that you, you become familiar with these uh, sort of binary pattern matching uh, syntaxes uh, pretty quickly. Um, because you might, you'll definitely use them to be able to start chunking uh, the data in uh, from like a sensor or like a temperature probe or something like that. But most importantly, I feel, is that it gives us a great story for connectivity. As I mentioned, uh, original projects that I've developed were done under like uh, Raspberry, uh, uh, under uh, uh, Arduino devices, and uh, those devices make it very difficult if you ever want to be able to speak to the outside world or start connecting to web servers. Uh, with NERVS and Elixir, it's really great because you can just kind of pretend like it works the way that you work on uh, things right now. You can just reach out to the outside world using uh, Phoenix or uh, just HTTP requests. Uh, communicating with the outside world is, is quite simple. So who is it for? Well, the first, we sort of split into two different categories here. And the first one is that it's for makers. Uh, at the uh, conference last year, I believe, uh, we've uh, had some, uh, some people put together some stuff. Uh, here's uh, uh, Luke, uh, who put the uh, helicopter platform together. 
Uh, this one is really cool because uh, I've personally liked to fly and build drones. And uh, what he's done is he's 3D printed his own drones that actually run a Raspberry Pi using nerves. Uh, he's gone so far as to build a base station for it as well that's very slick and cool. Um, I really like this project a lot, uh, mainly because uh, it's, uh, it's just funny how it works. I've spent a lot of time building nerves and I don't get a whole lot of time to be able to build stuff with nerves. And this was one of those ones that I was like, I really want to do this. And I'm like, ah, somebody else beat me to it. <laughs> Uh, we also have uh, Jeff Smith. He uh, uh, did a talk last year at ElixirConf US. Uh, he's been using Nerves to be able to build a project that uses software-defined radios to do airline uh, traffic uh, uh, tracking. Uh, here's a screenshot of some of his software where he's been able to uh, uh, use this, this radio beacon to be able to intercept um, ADB, uh, ADSB, ADSB signals from air, uh, air traffic and uh, being able to like render them and overlay them on this map. You can even do like heat maps with it as well. And this is an example of being able to build the device that can expose a server that's written using Phoenix that can render these web pages for you. James Smith, he also did a uh, talk recently at uh, uh, the US conference. He's doing vehicle tracking in a similar fashion. Ooh, fast forward there. Uh, he built a device, uh, prototyped a device pretty quickly with some off-the-shelf parts that he could put into the back of his vehicle to be able to uh, actually build out a project for a client to be able to uh, 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 track schedules for uh, transit systems. And uh, one of my favorite ones as well, this is Tim Mecklem. Tim Mecklem uh, is a, a sort of a natural born maker in this case. Uh, Tim. Uh, his wife has diabetes, and so he wanted a way to be able to try to be able to do closed loop uh, uh, glucose monitoring, that it would just give you that dosage when they needed to. Um, and so he actually took a lot of the uh, work towards building a device that would communicate with a, a diabetic pump uh, that would uh, be able to do all the calculations and figure out how to be able to come up with the right dosage. Uh, his project, I believe, is also available online. I'm not sure if I had the access to the uh, link yet, but. Um, uh, I really think Tim is interesting in this case because I've always had this fascination with hardware personally, but when it came to, uh, like, the fascination that I had was that you could write code that could actually, like, control or manipulate physical things in the world. That was just awesome. I mean, it all starts with blinking an LED light. That's the hello world that was, as we, uh, we call it, of nerves. And just that capability of knowing that now your code can have a physical effect on things is important. Tim went so far as to, like, during his development cycles, he needed data. And the data that he needed to get, he could get it from his wife, but he went so far as to commit to actually getting it installed in himself. Even though he doesn't have diabetes personally, he went through all the pain and practice on uh, 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 working with his hardware to be able to gain access to that data. So that's pretty, pretty neat. Now, NERVS isn't just for makers, though. NERVS is also being used in production prominently around uh, the world. Um, for production cases, one of uh, uh, the first one that I have is uh, Latote. Uh, Latote's a company that uh, I work for and sponsored uh, my travel here. Uh, Latote, uh, at Latote, what we do is we do warehouse management uh, with NERVS. We build kiosk stations to be able to track items throughout the warehouse. Uh, we've also open sourced a lot of our projects and bases, so you can check out our GitHub page and see this stuff. This is a RFID reader that we use from Thing Magic. You can also purchase these off the shelves. So if you're interested in doing RFID work uh, with nerves for yourself or professionally, uh, the library that we run this on is also open sourced as well. So you can very quickly and easily get up and running with that. Another example in production is Rose Point Navigation. Uh, this is a company out of uh, Seattle, and they build a device that does uh, uh, heavy lifting on, uh, uh, on the network protocols, uh, pretty much. There's a, I believe, they, they, they build devices for uh, boats, and there's a lot of sensors and uh, uh, things on, uh, on these boats that uh, speak all kinds of different protocols or uh, lower level protocols, CAN bus, stuff like that. And they wanted a way to be able to capture all of that data and uh, sort of accumulate it in a way that they could visualize it on their systems. And so this is a device that basically hooks into all the sensors and uh, just does all kinds of binary parsing. 
Uh, nerves really worked out well for them because uh, Erlang, uh, in this case, was very fast at doing all of the binary pattern matching. Um, but in addition, if it were, were to become overwhelmed, it handled the stress properly and uh, wasn't able to be uh, easily DDoSed if, in a sense of like uh, too much data coming in, um, it had enough overhead to be able to relax, uh, uh, react properly. Another example is uh, the National Association of Realtors uh, in the States. They use NERVS to be able to build smart home devices uh, that can monitor uh, temperature and environment. Uh, um, and they use this data to be able to try to, to inform buyers of uh, houses uh, on the energy efficiencies or just to provide an extra layer of information that they would need for whether or not they want to purchase a house in this area, this area, or that area, and what the normal uh, specifications sort of should be. One of my other favorites is FarmBot. Uh, FarmBot, these guys are cool. They do, they build a device that uh, does farming, automated farming for you, essentially. Uh, it's sort of like a 3D printer-esque robot, in a way, that uh, 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 will automatically seed and water and monitor all of your uh, crops that are, that are in the, uh, uh, that space. Uh, it's got computer vision to be able to determine whether there's weeds, and it does weed suppression as well. Um, I really want to get one of these installed at my house. <laughs> It'd be so much fun. And more recently, too, we've seen a lot of people pop up. Uh, uh, but uh, one of the great ones, too, is SmartRent. And uh, SmartRent has built a system for uh, allowing uh, rental property managers, uh, giving them a way to be able to build a, uh, a home automation system so that they can allow customers to sort of set up times to see properties. And they can just show up, and the doors will unlock for them, and go in and check it out and everything, too. So this is all great, but you know, how do we get started with this stuff, right? Because building hardware is fun. Uh, we should be able to, uh, so let's see how we can get up and running. Uh, the first place is to be able to check out our documentation. Uh, we have it hosted on Hexdocs. Uh, as of right now, I apologize for the, uh, the lengthiness of the, uh, the URL in that case. Uh, NERVS is currently in the release candidate for our 1.0 release, uh, which should be coming out shortly. Um, and so this is going to get you to the more uh, latest, uh, the latest documentation. Uh, by following along with that, there's some prerequisites that we require to be installed, uh, uh, including for your system, uh, extra tools uh, that NERVS needs to be able to build firmware. But once you've installed your host requirements, it's pretty much as easy as installing our new project generator. Uh, in this case, you can use the, uh, the shortcut for mix archive.install from hex, the NERVS bootstrap dependency. And once again, uh, a little bit of fun trickery because we have to, we're in our release candidate, you have to specify the version uh, for the 1.0 stuff so you can actually get a hold of that and start using it. So what do we really, like, how do we make things different? Well, the mix file is really where a lot of the magic happens for any project, and ours is no different. We expand out a sort of mindset in the case of the mix file that you can do multi-target. So out of the box, when you say mixnerves.new, it's going to generate a project that's going to support the ability of running on any of the supported hardware that we offer. And we declare out all of these different, different systems uh, with uh, the dependencies for them as well. And uh, uh, in this case, then, it'll allow you to be able to set the environment variable mix target to one of those different strings, RPI, RPI 0, RPI 2, RPI 3, depending on what board you're using. And then you, uh, you can just say uh, mix firmware, and it'll create a firmware bundle for that. And we'll see more about that in a minute as well. Now, the easiest way to be able to get started playing with NERVS is to be able to do some of, uh, uh, just to, to toy around with uh, uh, a piece of hardware. And the easiest piece of hardware that we have for messing around with by far is the Raspberry Pi Zero. And the reason for this is because we get a lot out of it. Um, often, like with, with NERVS devices, uh, a network connection is important because we can use things like a remote shell uh, uh, or even observer to be able to uh, inspect and, and poke around with a remote node as well. So the fun thing about the Raspberry Pi Zero is that this middle, this, this middle port here that we have, uh, it's known as the gadget port. We have it configured that it'll, uh, from the USB connection to your laptop, it'll not only provide power to the board, but it'll also open up a uh, virtual Ethernet and serial port uh, as well. So you can uh, gain a console into the, uh, 
uh, the device, and also uh, it'll have network uh, connection across to your computer as well. So you can do things like push more firmware and things like that. So this is my favorite slide. Let's see some stuff work. <laughs> Maybe. All right, so I'm going to hold that one aside in case I need it. Um, so what I'm going to do first, so we have the new project generator. So let's say uh, mix nerves.new, and I'll say uh, demo one, because I already have got my cooking recipe backup ready to go. And when you use our new project generator, it's going to ask you some uh, traditional questions you might be used to if you're going to install dependencies and things like that. Now, out of the box, uh, uh, NERVS runs in, like I said, a multi uh, multiple different uh, uh, like ways. There's ways to be able to run it. And, and the, the biggest thing to think of is this idea of mixed target. So we have some documentation that dumps out here that talks about mixed target. Now, if you don't set mixed target, uh, if you, if you have it unset or, or it's not set to anything, it's, it's running in what's known as host mode, which means it's not going to do any cross compil compilation. Uh, it's not going to compile things for like the other processor. It's meant to be able to run on your computer in that case. And this mode is interesting because uh, it allows you to be able to set up aspects of your project that you can still use mixed test with. So you can test your logic, uh, but not necessarily run the tests on the board. So what we're going to do first, let's go into our uh, demo project here, and we're going to uh, export mix target equals RPI 0. And the next thing we do now that we have our mix target set is um, we have to fetch our dependencies for that target. Uh, in the latest version of NERVS, uh, the uh, dependency fetching will also resolve, there's a section at the end where it resolves artifacts. Building a NERVS system from scratch can take a quite a long time. Uh, our traditional, our, our supported systems, especially for the Raspberry Pi Zero, take upwards of about 30 to 40 minutes to compile the system from scratch. And so what we do is we pre-digest that compilation time for you and serve the artifacts uh, that can be then fetched during the time of uh, fetching your dependencies. In this case, it's noticing that on my machine, I already have those already cached. Uh, so it's just going to use them and tie them together. And then really, at this point, I can just call mix uh, firmware. And what it'll do is it's going to cross-compile all the code for uh, ARM, uh, for the ARM processor that's on this. Uh, then it goes in to be able to build an OTP release. Uh, it then uh, will uh, marry together in your OTP release any ex extra files you might have. Uh, we call that a root file system overlay. Uh, and then produce this uh, firmware file. So if I expand this out, you'll see it, it made this image demo1.fw. And then we can use that file to be able to burn it to an SD card by saying mix firmware.burn. Uh, and if I plug my SD card reader in and burn it, it would do that. Uh, where am I at? 22? Good. Let's have some fun. Mm -hmm. Never enough USB ports when you need them. Mm -hmm. So just by having the SD card plugged into your machine, when you hit mix firmware.burn, it'll recognize that card and say, yes, that's the one I want. It'll require some elevated privileges. Let me just type in password, one, two, three, four, five. Same combination of my luggage. <laughs> And there you have it, it burns the image. Now, I'm going to boot this up, but in the meantime, I'd like to point out the size. 28.16 megabytes. That is the Linux kernel, Erlang runtime, everything we need to be able to start and boot our application in the tiny little package space. So we can create very minimal application images that can be distributed over uh, the air uh, uh, quite easily. And so as I mentioned here, this port also acts as a serial console. Uh, one of the great features, do, 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 matching text size, yeah, All right. <laughs> so I'll plug my board in here, and this is going to um, boot up and recapture. There we go. And within a matter of, I think this board boots in a matter of about three seconds. Uh, we are at our IEX prompt. And this is, so this is where you can get started with things then. 
The very first thing we do is we do some formatting. Uh, but you'll also notice that we're getting, uh, uh, these aren't necessarily errors, uh, but uh, info and error. These, these are actually kernel messages coming from the Linux kernel. Um, one of the helpers that we use with NURBS uh, is uh, we also, we, we take any Linux land uh, uh, log messages uh, that come through, and we bring them into Elixir Logger so that you can choose to use whatever logger backend you want to be able to offload or triage any of your logs. And that's including both the Linux log messages and any of the Elixir ones as well. Uh, one of my favorite new features, uh, since I have a little bit of time to be able to show you this, uh, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm going to do it. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's have some fun quick. Uh, this might be a little tiny for everybody, uh, but this certainly won't be. Um, I'm going to add a new dependency. Uh, we're actually going to be we're, we're considering adding this as part of our uh, base systems called uh, Ring Logger. Uh, one of the things that we found difficult with uh, NERVs is uh, oftentimes you'll find yourself connecting over remote shell. Uh, to be able to like see what's going on with a node. And uh, over remote shell, you lose access to log messages because the console's being the, the, uh, displayed on the group leader, which is like on the console that's on the device, which is not very easy to get to most of the time. And since you're connecting over remote shell, you don't get that benefit. Uh, with ring logger, we can do some fun things like, uh, for example, let's uh, config uh, logger. Backends to just be the ring logger. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll mix new firmware. Now, I'm taking the long road here because I don't have enough time to be able to show uh, uh, the next step of things, which is not pulling the SD card out and having the SD card swap every time. Uh, we have a package called Mix Firmware SSH that, using the built-in network connection that I spoke about, uh, allows you to be able to just push the new firmware update over to it. So you don't have to, the very first time you bootstrap it with your SD card, you shouldn't have to pull it out after that. You can just keep sending new firmware to it. So now that we have our new firmware on here running with Ring Logger, and only Ring Logger, because I turned the console logger off, uh, we should be able to go over here and clear our our state, and when we come back up, we shouldn't see any new log messages because they're no longer going to the console. <laughs> and we'll just sort of get to an IEX prompt. Uh, so where do all my log messages go? Good question. <laughs> uh, Ring logger is cool because of many reasons. Uh, for one, uh, we can attach to it which means now our process is going to be monitoring logs. So if I, if I require logger and I do a debug message, we'll see that that actually comes through now because we're attached. Um, we can also uh, detach and send a log message and we won't get it. But now this is the fun part about NERS devices. You always show up after the bad thing happened and you're like, uh, how do I get that information? Uh, ring logger is a circular ring buffer that allows you to be able to get access to all of the log messages. That was the tail function since the time that the board booted. So we hit tail and we can see here the kernel starts coming up and uh, we, can, we finally get into Erlang right around here, I believe, uh, just, on, just about over two and a half seconds. Or uh, under, wait, that's too early. It comes up right about here, early in. So just about two seconds or so the board will boot in. And that's going through Linux and everything. So ring logger is a lot of fun. You got to you got to try it out. Um, I, I personally actually even think that it's it's a uh, uh, I like it even as a better replacement to the console logger that's already included uh, because it will uh, it will also uh, you know when you're in IEX and you uh, you have log messages coming through and you're trying to type at the same time and it just keeps blowing away the line and you're like ah <laughs> and by the way Control L I found that out and it comes back brings the line back with ring logger when you attach to it 
uh, your IEX line is always accessible at the bottom of the window and all the I.O. comes in streaming above it. So you're never in that situation anymore where you get lost in trying to figure out what you're typing. It's actually quite useful even for non-NERVS projects. All right. So that's my demo part. Let's go back to the awkwardness of trying to dance between mirroring and not. Great. So what else can we do with it? Well, NERVS uh, is starting to really open up in what we can pr produce with these devices, one of which is touchscreen interfaces. Uh, this is a Raspberry Pi 7-inch touchscreen display, uh, supports multi-touch, runs on uh, uh, usually a Pi 3. Uh, the B Plus runs really nice and fast on it. And uh, this, uh, for Latote, we build these kiosks, as we call them, uh, and put them out in our warehouse to be able to allow users, uh, 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 workers, to be able to uh, interact with uh, the rest of the warehouse systems. Uh, we build one for Raspberry Pi 3, but we also build one for uh, x86, so you can actually take off-the-shelf hardware, like all-in-one computers that run on Intel, and take this system and actually just burn nerves uh, uh, firmware to them. The absurdity of this, I can't get over. They have, usually have like one terabyte internal drives that we use like, I don't know, 90 megabytes of. <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, you can check those out on the Latote team uh, GitHub page uh, to get started with them. There's also a great README on there you can use to be able to uh, see how to uh, run them as well. If you're looking for other fun stuff to do, we have a lot of uh, example projects that you can just out of the box check out, pull down, and, try and build up. Uh, these include uh, Blinky and um, uh, uh, getting familiar with GPIO, like how can you start playing with GPIO pins to be able to like control things in the world. Um, it also has an example project on how to be able to build in a Phoenix uh, web server uh, so that you can start uh, um, um, like like as if you have like a home router. You're building a home router. You know, you, you open up your uh, uh, Chrome or Firefox or your web browser and you point it to the address of it and it'll serve you the web page and that's where you can configure the device. It's a really nice way and convenient way to be able to like take your nerves device and ex expose like a user interface uh, so that you can, you know, make configuration changes. And so one of the most exciting pieces of this actually, is so much fun to play with, is, ner is uh, the Phoenix channels. Uh, Phoenix channels with NERVS devices are so great because there's a lot of support for them and, and various libraries for, for various other devices. For example, iPhones and iPads or mobile devices. Uh, Android also has a, a Phoenix channels library. And so very easily you can just run a Phoenix server on your NERVS device that can expose channels and allow you to be able to have your phone uh, use that as a communication protocol so you can do real-time data streaming between the two devices. And so uh, here's an example of, what, of a, uh, a device that I built, uh, a labyrinth game, a uh, very easy uh, thing. We took uh, two servo motors for the X and the Y that you'd normally you know, turn the knobs, and we connected it to a NERVS device that would then map the gyroscope of the phone using Phoenix channels, streaming at 50 hertz, uh, very responsive to play the game. I think this is a video, yeah. So you just tilt the phone, to play the game, you see the marble moving, and oh, it went down a hole. <laughs> so that's a BeagleBone Black down there. It's just two servo motors. It's a very simple project to put together. Uh, but NERVS really is, um, uh, it's starting to take off now. It's, it's got a lot of great contributors. And that's, that's, we really get a lot of thanks from the community on people that uh, put towards an effort. This is uh, probably out of date at this point, but it's a contribution graph of most of the people. Uh, that are contributing uh, code, but we also have uh, uh, contributions from other locations. Uh, uh, Latote sponsors a lot of my time to be able to build NERVS. Smart Ren as well for Frank Hunleth, and a lot of other people that are backing us, um, including uh, Cultivate even too. They're uh, huge fans of NERVS, um, and uh, uh, all kinds of other people. If I haven't mentioned your name directly, I'm sorry, um, but thank you so much for your contribution. So, now, all this great stuff. Imagine you're in an era of near infinite inventive possibility and that you have new hardware to be able to play with, to be able to build whatever you want to build. And there's new languages and frameworks that are available to be able to make it easier than ever to get up and running and building whatever Internet of Things devices that you want to be able to build. Thanks.
Thank you, Justin. Um, so I estimate we have about 10 minutes uh, for questions. That's probably about 10 questions. Um, so go for it. Who's first? Hi, thanks for the talk. Thank you. Uh, we've got nerves of production running and it's brilliant. And we've got it coupled with channels and stuff and it, it works like a charm. Um, seeing that you've got an image, a firmware target for x86-64, uh, is there a plan to have like nerves be a generic deployment platform so everybody can get rid of Docker? Sure. Uh, great question. Uh, actually, uh, I've toyed with getting it to run on Docker many times, uh, just for even simplicity and development purposes. Uh, NERVs can really be ported to essentially run on mostly anything. I say mostly to you know capture those edge cases that it might be more difficult. Uh, but essentially, uh, the way I like to think about it is that um, we're we're good at we're really good at two things: cross compiling stuff for the target and sort of packaging it in a unikernel-like way. Uh, and so with those two pieces as the foundation, uh, even though we like to target creating uh, a more simplistic, uh, simple experience in developing embedded hardware, you can actually use NERVs to be able to package any elixir thing that you want uh, and uh, run it on a target. So yeah, you can, we can uh, uh, certainly create more generic NURBS systems that can run in places like AWS or other cloud providers or Docker or uh, we also have ones uh, uh, I didn't mention as well, I, I don't think I had it on my slide, but we have uh, Quemu, which is a, the Quemu virtual machine. Uh, we have systems that will run on there as well so that you can uh, have a simulated development environment that can run on your desktop. Any more questions? Uh, it's been a while since I last uh, worked with NERVs, but that, uh, um, I think you mentioned at some point that it would be easier at one time to like add, st add stuff to the root file system at some point, like packaging external libraries, etc. So um, I'm just wondering, like, uh, is, is there any improvement in that area? Sure. Uh, one aspect of it is that our brand new new project generator automatically expands out this folder as part of your project called rootfs overlay. And anything you put underneath this project will map one to one to the directory path that it will exist in on the target. And so we can see here this is in ETS IEX.exs. And so if I go to our running node here and I just uh, uh, take a look at that directory, you'll see that it uh, also contains our uh, IEX.exs file. And uh, so yeah, you can add additional uh, raw file contents to the read-only system using this method. You can also uh, add any additional C code you want and use Elixir Make. And under the hood, we'll, uh, we have examples on how to be able to connect that so that it can cross, it can use leverage our cross compilers properly. Uh, which means you can bring in any extra C, uh, C++ code that you want. And uh, 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 very recently, we also put in support that we're going to be uh, allowing cross-compiled Go and Rust uh, to be able to be easily added to the systems as well. Uh, so you can take a look out for that as, uh, also. Um, and then from there, uh, you can use like the firmware push mechanisms to be able to synchronize the contents. Uh, there was a talk I did a while back about something called the uh, NERVS reactor. Uh, it's still under development. Um, we, we found that we needed to be able to do some additional work necessary to be able to connect the environment that way. Uh, but ver uh, very shortly after 1.0, we're going to be uh, continuing and finishing that portion of it. And what that'll do is it'll connect, it'll over the network, uh, uh, basically do hot code reloading and file uh, content uh, uh, synchronization between the NERVS device in development and your laptop, uh, making the experience a lot like developing using Phoenix Live Reload. Yep, and the, got one in the back there. Uh, hello, thank you for your talk. I have a question. Most of the Raspberry Pi come with the Bluetooth. 
Is there any plan to use the Bluetooth and uh, be LTE, not be, uh, BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy? Great question. Our official systems do not turn on Bluetooth by default, only because it requires bringing in Blue Z, which is Linux, the Linux Bluetooth dependency. It's very big. And uh, uh, the reason we don't do it is because most of the time, everybody's usually only interested in the Bluetooth LE portion of things. And Blue Z brings in a lot of the old classic baggage. Uh, there's not, there hasn't been a, a public project that anybody's come forward with yet that they've directly required Bluetooth to push forward our support, our, our easier support for it. Um, but uh, 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 there are several C libraries out there that package just the LE portion that we're interested in trying to be able to play with. Uh, but there's nothing stopping you from yourself uh, forking one of our, our officially supported systems and turning on Blue Z for, for your own support. Hi. Um, is there any way to access the GPIO during development from my computer over the Raspberry Pi? Sure. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, on the Raspberry Pi, uh, I'm on this console of it right now. The GPIO is actually uh, uh, sysfs exposes a lot of that. So we can say sys class uh, GPIO. Uh, and the location, um, you can see here there's a lot of different things you can do. You can actually go and uh, trigger individual components. However, to work with GPIO easier, there's a project called Elixir Ale uh, that uh, Frank Hunleth wrote, uh, and that's just basically an Elixir API that allows you access to those GPIO pins to set them high, set them low, anything you want. You can actually, it'll, it'll also support some uh, protocols like SPI, I2C. So if you have uh, SPI or I2C chips or devices that are connected to those pins, uh, you can set those. Uh, the documentation that we have on the Raspberry Pi, uh, it, I believe is up to date and robust that it'll uh, even demonstrate and show you how to be able to apply custom overlays to the Raspberry Pi's GPIO setup so that you can do things like I2C and uh, stuff like that. But I, have I? To be, sorry, but I have to be always on the Raspberry Pi itself to, to test it out? Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the testing strategy for that, uh, because GPIO is a very hardware-centric thing, uh, we usually, in that case, recommend people to fall back to replaying data or stubs or mocks to actually test those API interface uh, uh, portions. Um, however, there are, uh, there is code out there that we have available on our website that uh, is all open source that shows how our hard, we have a hardware test forum that we have for NERVs that anytime anybody in the project commits code to modify one of the systems, it'll pack it, it'll go through the whole thing of packaging firmware and it'll, it'll add, there's a Phoenix server that hooks into our continuous integration. It runs it, but it, it shows an example on how to be able to package X unit tests on a device and then ask them to run. So you can, in development, uh, set aside a set of boards that are in test mode that know how to be able to receive firmware that packages with it X unit tests and then execute them on the board and report results back somewhere else. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, that's about it. Um, let's give Justin a final sort of close. Thank you.